Lesson number three, Adam's choice, Cain's choice. Welcome again to the what informs, the why transforms. Today I will be focusing on the perfectly just and merciful treatment of Adam, our first father, and Eve, our first mother, as they were cast out from the Garden of Eden. I will also focus on God's perfectly just treatment of their son Cain, who committed the first murder of our world. As discussed in Lesson 2, Adam and Eve were created in a perfect state. That way only their own actions could make them imperfect. They were placed in a pristine garden known as Eden, and set to the task of identifying all forms of life in the world which they now inhabited. The events of the Garden of Eden are among the most debated and controversial events of history. Many claim that they could not have happened. Some even dare to assume that man originated as a lower life form that eventually gained sentience on his own. As I shared in Lesson 2, this discounts all laws of physics, biology, and logic. It is not worth the time it would take to tackle this maelstrom of logicality and backwards thinking any more than I already have. I wish instead to target major flaws in people's understanding of our righteous first parents. Of those who believe in Adam and Eve, many misconceptions arise. I wish to identify eight of these and to show why they are not logical. Most of these are the prevailing beliefs shared between branches of Christianity, non-Orthodox Judaism, and Shia Islam. Misunderstanding number one. Adam and Eve could have children in the Garden of Eden. This is extrapolated from the sentence made by the Lord that, quote, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. I will tear into this pervasive mistranslation in the next point, but my emphasis here is on the multiply part. Most modern takes on scripture assume that, as multiplying anything by zero results in zero, there must have been at least some conception before the fall. The common belief is that had Adam and Eve not fallen, we would all continue to exist in the Garden of Eden and been happy. Of course, Adam would be a villain if he denied all of us the chance to live in paradise forever, but that is not what happened. This is not a point that the Bible can clarify in its current form. Like many points of doctrine, it must be taken on faith that Adam and Eve lack the physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional ability to have children while yet in the Garden. We learn from the Book of Mormon that if Adam had not transgressed, he would not have fallen, but he would have remained in the Garden of Eden, and all things which were created must have remained in the same state in which they were after they were created, and they must have remained forever and had no end, and they would have had no children, wherefore they would have remained in a state of innocence, having no joy, for they knew no misery, doing no good, for they knew no sin. But behold, all things have been done in the wisdom of him who knoweth all things. Adam fell that men might be and men are, that they might have joy. This clarity irons out in a few verses conflicts that have caused schism after schism in churches governed purely by their own logic. Misunderstanding number two. The fall of Adam and Eve was a great sin for which all mankind is now responsible. The mere fact that we were born into the family of Adam implies that we were born with sin, as Eve was the first to partake of the fruit, she is among the earth's greatest sinners and failures. This is a tragedy of errors caused by the devil's unshakable desire to besmirch the names of two of his greatest nemeses, Patriarch Adam and his righteous counterpart Eve. Hearken back, if you will, earlier in Adam and Eve's tenure in the Garden of Eden, the two commandments that God gave to these chosen and elect souls. First, go forth and multiply and replenish the earth. And second, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. These two commandments, given in order of priority, stood in opposition to one another. Having no ability to have children, or even knowledge of how they could, Adam and Eve could not fulfill both commands at the same time. Latter-day Revelation makes it very clear that Satan appeared first to Adam and demanded that he partake of the fruit. Adam, seeking to follow God's commandments, refused. However, when righteous Eve was tempted, she realized that she could not fulfill the commandment to replenish the earth without violating the commandment to partake of the fruit. She chose to violate the second law in hopes of fulfilling the first. She then persuaded Adam that he could not obey either of God's commandments without following her, and the only commandment left for her to follow was to go forth and multiply and replenish the earth. Eve, by choosing to take the fruit, chose to prioritize her role as the mother of all living. Adam, by choosing to follow her, chose to prioritize his role as the patriarch of mankind. Why then, some may ask, if they were choosing to obey God's more important commandment, would Adam and Eve be cast out? The reason was simple. In the garden there was only immortality and ignorance. Like a child who has never experienced hunger or cold or sickness, they cannot understand the meanings of fullness or warmth or health. Life was devoid of meaning in the garden. 
that partaking of the fruit brought death to the posterity of Adam and Eve was inevitable. God will not lie. He would fulfill that promise. He would, however, not punish them for sinning when, in fact, no sin had been committed. The fall of Adam is not described as a sin, but a transgression. Transgression comes from a Latin word meaning to walk across, or rather perpendicular to. Sin, on the other hand, comes from the Latin word sons, meaning guilty. The difference between the two is similar to, though not perfectly comparable to, the difference between manslaughter and murder. Manslaughter, the accidental taking of human life, is typically characterized by people acting perpendicular to the law, acting carelessly, recklessly, disobedient to laws or established safety rules. It is a tragedy, one that creates a debt to society that has to be paid. However, given time and help, the one who kills someone by accident may return a more productive member of society than before, one who chooses to be careful and follow the rules that are there to protect them. It is not the same for someone who kills in cold blood. It takes far more than tears and promises to prove that a convicted murderer can ever become a benefit to the society she or he knowingly harmed. To that end, Adam's fall had positive outcomes. It had to have a consequence, otherwise a God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever cannot be justified in punishing those who commit other crimes. He would cease to be just if he did not punish Adam and Eve for going perpendicular to his laws. However, Adam and Eve's fall would have positive outcomes. Though they could not take back their decision to partake of the fruit, they would go forward as constructive members of society. Their fall was not an accident. It was definitely acting perpendicular to God's commandment not to partake of the fruit, but its results were not exclusively negative. In fact, they were very positive, and Adam and Eve are to be extolled for bringing about these positive results, not demeaned. By choosing to obey God's first commandment to them, they were to be blessed, not cursed, admired, not spited. Though they could not understand the exact requirements of living in the mortal world, they chose this destination for themselves and would be given what they asked for, for better or for worse. Their children were born mortal. This was the single heritage they gained from Adam's transgression. They have not inherited Adam's transgression as part of their own burden of sin. To Adam was promised the coming of a savior, one who could and would take away his sins. This could only have been a joy to Adam if he had felt the heartache of having disobeyed one of God's commandments. Had he never transgressed, the idea of a savior would have been meaningless. Likewise, as God is no respecter of persons, just as Adam and Eve were brought into the world as perfect sinless beings who had to bring sin upon themselves, all children are afforded the same right. Misunderstanding number three. Eve was tempted to eat the fruit by a snake, and all snakes were punished accordingly. It is seen as strange by many antagonists of Christianity that the common depiction of the Garden of Eden would show an animal, in this case a serpent, as the being that tempted Eve to take of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There are several points to be made here. First, whether in Eden or in the fallen world we now inhabit, animals know and recognize that God who created them. They use the limited freedom of choice they have been granted to follow and obey their divine roles. Those unfortunate children who have been raised in the wild by dogs or wolves and have been brought back into human society have, without failure, mentioned the guiding force that commands and governs all beasts and that no beast would ever dare to choose to resist. That only the direct offspring of God would choose to disobey him implies that the serpent here was in fact not an animal at all, but one of God's own offspring, in this case that angel who was cast out from the presence of God and became the devil. When taken in this light, God's proclamation to the serpent makes much more sense. Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Some take this to mean that God removed feet from all snakes and made them eat dust, but the logic does not hold when taken in that light. Instead, this is a direct proclamation to the devil of his fate. It is possible that he assumed that, because he had dragged so many souls down with him to hell, he would have an easy time destroying the mortal population at his will and pleasure. This curse shows that he would not have the ability to directly influence Adam and Eve or their posterity after they left the garden, only by eating the dust of the earth, or rather by feeding, so to speak, on the dregs of society. Those who were righteous, like Adam and Eve, would be protected from the devil and his seed, meaning those who chose to follow him, by the enmity that was placed between them. That enmity is the Savior, the one to whom if man would merely look, he would be shielded from the devil's ravenous jaws. 
Notably, the enmity was placed specifically between Eve and the serpent, as well as generally between all of her seed and the seed of the serpent. The seed of Eve is not just her offspring, which all of us are. It is those offspring who do the work of Eve, which is the work of righteousness. This statement was given to the devil before Adam and Eve's own fate, showing him once and for all that he had failed in his quest to destroy God's earth. He was not to be humored in his delusions of grandeur that he was somehow playing in God's league. Misunderstanding number four, that Adam and Eve were naked in the Garden of Eden and became ashamed of this after eating of the fruit, is interpreted by many to mean that we should be ashamed of our mortal bodies, rather than amazed at their complexity and intricacy. That Adam and Eve were naked and became ashamed of their nakedness had at least four major effects. First, when God returned to the garden and asked, Who told thee that thou wast naked? He already knew the answer. He did not need Adam to tell him. He probably also did not expect Adam to lie to him, which Adam also did not do. In the end, it was the shame of being naked that proved to Adam, all in all, that there had been a change wrought in his body and mind. God could have told Adam that he had disobeyed him. He could have told him to be ashamed. He did not. Rather, he allowed Adam to feel the shame of his own actions, so he, Adam, as well as Eve, would recognize that the fate that was about to befall them was just and merciful. They felt the shame and could not deny it, so they could tell that God's proclamation of their spiritual nakedness before him was just. Second, upon casting Adam and Eve from Eden, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. This ceremonial clothing could have been done in any number of ways, but God chose to clothe Adam and Eve with skins, implying that one of the animals Adam and Eve had learned to love while in the garden would have had to have been sacrificed to provide these skins. This would have taught Adam and Eve a real-world lesson in the power of sacrifice, a command that God would give Adam upon his leaving the garden. Third, providing clothing would show mankind's physical and spiritual dependence on God for their protection. As Adam and Eve did not have fur or scales to protect them like their animal friends, God had provided their clothing, which implies that God valued their physical well-being, but it also showed their reliance on their spiritual parent. They would teach this to their own children by providing clothing for them, even as we do down to this day. Fourth, it showed that, unlike the beasts of the field which have no qualms about exercising their divine rights to procreate at any time or in any place, man is to respect the body he has been given, as it is in God's image and the creation of future children is to be safeguarded for the most sacred of situations. There are likely many other reasons that Adam and Eve were commanded to wear clothing, but these are at least some of the reasons. Misunderstanding number five, the character of Lilith, and or the idea that Adam engaged in sexual sin. Somewhere in the 500s AD, long after the fall of Jerusalem and the scattering of the Jews, the fictional character of Lilith appeared in the spoken lore of Judaism, and was passed to Christianity. The disturbing story that had pervaded much of Judeo-Christian mythos, but has no basis in the Torah, is as follows. Before creating Eve, God supposedly created Lilith, a semi-demonic entity who chose to partake of the fruit right away. When Adam rejected her advances, she left the garden and procreated with the beasts of the field. After Adam and Eve fell, the story says that Adam stayed with Eve for a time until after the birth of Cain and Abel, but then grew sick of her since she had persuaded him to fall, and sought out Lilith. With her, he supposedly produced a race of demi-humans who would be the primary inhabitants of the antediluvian world. Other theories exist about the fruit of knowledge being fornication, among other things. That Adam and Eve were married before entering the garden is supported by Josephus and restated by Latter-day Revelation. This puts to shame any theorists that suggest that Adam and Eve could have engaged in such base practices. That Adam and Eve engaged in sexual activities is undeniable, but it was within their right as a couple married under the proper authority, in this case, the authority of God himself. It is also clear through latter-day revelations that Adam chose to fall so that he and Eve could be together. This shows an earnestness of Adam's character that cannot be denied, that he would choose to be with his wife no matter the cost, that he could leave her later for a sexually driven temptress is further machinations of the devil to decry his character as a man of righteousness who kept the law of chastity all the days of his mortal probation. Eve was given her name because she was to be the mother of all living, a calling that would be entirely untrue if there had been a woman before her. The fact that all people of earth were the offspring of Adam and Eve also clears up some of the writings in the Apocrypha that had been viewed as doctrine by many, that the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve engaged in incestuous relationships. Incest is generally understood as sexual relations between related peoples, which is grievous to society. An unspoken part of that definition, however, 
that is most grievous to the Lord is that incest is typically physically and emotionally abusive in nature. This is the view of most of the world of the posterity of Adam and Eve, and it is false doctrine. Among the children of Adam, of whom there were many, this abomination would not have been the status quo, as there were no other potential choices. They were taught by their loving parents to love each other and value their covenants with each other. Their genes were not yet subject to passing on destructive mutations through what is modernly called inbreeding. If there was any abuse committed from a husband to his wife or a wife to her husband, that is answered on their heads, not the heads of the whole human family. There was no Lilith, so there was no unholy offspring of Lilith, so there was no sexual sin committed by the righteous posterity of Adam in marrying their close relatives. God has never and will never turn a blind eye to incest or sexual abuse. Misunderstanding number six. Many believe that Eve cursed all women who followed her to feel immense pain in childbearing. That she was promised an increase in pain in conception implies to many that conception was somehow easy in the garden and then became hard, which denounces the value of the eternally binding nature of a mother's physical labor. A proper look at the Hebrew origins of this scripture reveals the original intent behind these words. Unto the woman he said, I will increase thy discomfort and thy size in thy conception. In other words, he was letting her know about the physical change that would occur during pregnancy, which is something she would not have known because, as stated, she had not been able to have children in the garden. This is within the purview of a just and merciful God, to let her know what she should expect when she was expecting. Unlike the handful of unfortunate women throughout the world who have been so uneducated as to the natural processes occurring within their own bodies to assume that this miracle of life is a medical malady, Eve was given at least a vague understanding of the signs that she had conceived. Imagine then the joy she must have felt upon feeling those changes in her body, knowing that they were the fulfillment of God's promise to her and all of her daughters forevermore. God had never intended for childbearing to be easy, because that would not have the power necessary to bind the hearts of mothers to their children. In that sense, childbirth is the single process, or dare I say ordinance, for I believe that childbirth is a sacred ordinance, that bears the closest resemblance to the Savior's own atonement, both in pain and in power. That leads to misunderstanding number seven. Any attempt to circumvent the pain of childbirth is an attempt to circumvent God's plan. This misunderstanding comes from the same verse which reads, In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. While this is an effective translation of the words, the intent of this verse may be translated like this, With empathy thou shalt raise thy children. This translation is reflected in some languages, especially those that were translated independently of the English translation. This is not to criticize the inspired translators of the English scriptures. English is an exceedingly robust language in which a single phrase can be construed and understood many different ways, which is beneficial for a deep dive into the words of God, but can also become a stumbling block. Certainly any pain that human women or any mammal experience in childbearing are not a curse, but a blessing. A painful blessing, to be sure, but a means by which women and females of all species that give live birth become inseparably connected to their offspring in a way that animals that lay eggs cannot experience. Humans are so dependent on their parents that even adults with children of their own may still rely and depend on their own mother and father for years to come. While it might sound like I'm suggesting that this misunderstanding is true, that women truthfully should feel pain in delivery and not avail themselves of the options available nowadays for pain reduction, I could not be more in favor of those mechanisms. Childbirth is a singularly painful event, but the entire process of carrying and raising a child is part of the sorrow that is promised here, not just to mothers, but to fathers as well. That a mother in particular will sorrow with her children when they sorrow, and feel pain when her children feel pain is a potent side effect of this blessing bestowed upon her first mother. Certainly with Eve having so many children, and some of them choosing to walk a path that took them away from God, Eve would sorrow all the days of her life. But only by experiencing such sorrow could she experience joy. There is no sin in availing oneself of the medical miracles available in our day. Misunderstanding number eight. Men are meant to dominate women because Eve fell first. This is pulled from the same scripture as before, which reads, And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. This translation was done in a day and age that was strongly influenced by the male-dominant culture of Dark Age Europe, a world where the combination of chauvinist paganism and corrupt, scriptureless Christianity declared men the dominant sex. However, a better word here would be preside. In a world without priesthood authority, the word preside may have been confusing to the inspired translators, but this translation is easily grasped in the light of the restoration of the priesthood. 
Though the priesthood was renamed in later generations after Aaron and Melchizedek, the priesthood is an unchanging scepter of righteousness that was given first to Adam, at least in terms of our world, in order to effectively guide his family. I say given to Adam, but if I may, I would describe that a different way. Adam was put under covenant to use the priesthood only in righteousness to preside over his family. The Lord has reiterated in our day, no power or influence can or ought to be maintained by virtue of the priesthood, only by persuasion, by long-suffering, by gentleness and meekness, and by love unfeigned, by kindness and pure knowledge, which shall greatly enlarge the soul without hypocrisy and without guile, reproving betimes with sharpness when moved upon by the Holy Ghost, and then showing forth afterwards an increase of love toward him whom thou hast reproved, lest he esteem thee to be his enemy. Again, we see in this scripture a use of virtue as a synonym of priesthood, that God commands all men who have received the covenant of the priesthood to guide with love and gentleness, not by the sheer nature of being a man. This command would have been given to Adam in some form as well, for God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, having no shadow of changing. Adam was not called to dominate his wife, but to be her partner. Likewise, Eve was to advise and assist Adam, even as she advised and assisted him to take the fruit. This made the two equals with different but complementary roles. The idea that God would permit, much less encourage men to physically, emotionally, or in any other way abuse their wives or children is utter blasphemy. It is so endemic of our society, this broken and twisted mentality, that men have the right to punish or hurt women or children, that fifteen inspired prophets of God have signed their names to this proclamation, and many others have added their testimony since. We warn that individuals who violate the covenants of chastity, who abuse spouse or offspring, or who fail to fulfill their family responsibilities, will one day stand accountable before God. This is not only addressed to men, as spousal and child abuse are not unique to men. Our society has seen an increasing number of abuses from wives to husbands and mothers to children, but it is never acceptable, regardless of who is initiating the abuse. Let me add in a statement here for all unfortunate victims of abuse. You are no more responsible for the actions of your abusers than you are for the fall of Adam. No matter what your abusers may tell you, you are a victim, not an instigator, and you are worthy of love. As a more unfortunate note, I wish to address women who seek to remove from men that which makes them equal to women, namely the office of the priesthood. Especially in our day when the common philosophy is women can do anything men can do. Some who covet the power of the priesthood but fail to understand their responsibility wonder why a fair and impartial God would not allow women to receive the oath and covenant of the priesthood. There are many reasons, but it is clear from God's individual interactions with Eve and Adam that he does all things in a set order. There is a pattern for all he does, or else the spiritual government of our families, homes, and churches would be run on anarchy. We see in these initial interchanges between God and newly fallen man that the roles of Adam and Eve were both definitively established, and these roles have not changed. Family circumstances may require adaptations, but adaptation is not the same as changing the mind or policies of an omniscient God. Any woman who would deny her womanhood in favor of manhood rejects God's initial commandments to Eve, just as certainly as any man who refuses to take the oath and covenant of the priesthood rejects God's commandments to Adam. His command to Eve was to have empathy, hence, in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. The auxiliary verb shall implies a promise or a covenant, and herein God is promising Eve that her daughters and she will feel something when they raise their children. That same something is promised to man when he shall rule over thee. To man and to woman God makes the same promise that by fulfilling their divine responsibilities in whatever sphere and circumstance they may be given, they may receive a fullness of God's glory and power. It is clarified in Latter-day Revelation that a man needs to make and keep the covenant to receive the priesthood in order to receive his salvation, while a woman needs only to honor the priesthood. She does not need to make that covenant for herself in order to have full access to her feminine potential, though she must still make all the other covenants that are made by men. This is true for the married and the single, the fertile and the barren, the old and the young, the mother, the grandmother, the sister, the aunt, the cousin, or any other relationship she may possess, for all races and all creeds. Is this a blessing that was given because Eve was the first to make the righteous decision to partake the fruit? Only God knows his reasons. These are only a handful of the falsehoods believed and espoused by those who teach the word of God without authority. 
Some may say that the doctrine of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints cannot be true, because it is not the dominant viewpoint. An adage suggests a million voices can't be wrong. If the whole world is so demeaning of Eve as a naive and foolish woman, and Adam as a blind follower, how so could it be untrue? Among Satan's most personal tactics is to sully the reputations of his enemies. Adam and Eve were two of the biggest chinks in Satan's plan. He went all in on the chance that if they partook of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they would surely die. He knew enough of the plan that he knew that Jesus was to come from the descendancy of Adam and Eve. If they were to die, they could not have children, and, as such, Jesus could never come. It would have seemed an instant and ultimate win worthy of Satan's personal involvement. Satan never supposed that God, whose time was infinite, could use time to his advantage to fulfill all of his promises. Adam and Eve certainly did die, but not for many, many years by earthly standards, giving them more than enough time to fulfill God's other commandment to go forth and multiply and replenish the earth. That Adam and Eve could go on to become the parents of mankind, even in spite of the guarantee of death, stymied a plan that Satan was confident would work. He used his best tactics, his most persuasive arguments, his best half-truths. He convinced Eve to partake of the fruit. Victory was guaranteed, and yet somehow he still lost. In fact, not only did he lose, it was only because Eve took of the fruit that she was able to fulfill her destiny as the mother of all living, and that Jesus was able to come from her line. Satan's masterful plan turned out to be his own absolute defeat. This loss consumes Satan to this day. Every descendant of Adam and Eve who lives does so because of the very difficult decision that Adam and Eve made to fall and become mortal so they could have children. One of the cornerstones of Satan's plan was proven at once to be a cornerstone of God's plan. In one fell swoop, God proved himself more powerful, more intelligent, more capable, more everything, leaving Satan as the loser in every contest, and God wasn't even competing. Satan, who chose to have no redeeming qualities of his own free will, simply cannot handle the fact that one of his best laid plans could turn around to become such a victory for his eternal adversary. Filled with bitterness and hatred, Satan has worked around the clock for six millennia to besmirch the reputation of Adam and Eve, who were integral in one of his greatest failures. It is difficult to besmirch God or the Savior, though Satan certainly tries, but Adam and Eve were mortal, making them targets that he can easily and relentlessly attack again and again. One may ask, if Satan had been a son of the morning, as it is said, how could he have missed the boat on this one? How did he not understand that God could and would make his plan work? How did he not understand that his best laid plan to push mankind down to the depths of hell forever would become one of the major stepping stones for mankind's eternal progression? The answer comes from the loss of light. We see it with mortals, those who once joined with the congregation in singing, I know that my Redeemer lives, begin to toe the line into sin and, in time, cannot even remember who or what a Redeemer is. This has happened again and again so much that it is an undeniable and incredible phenomenon that can only be described as miraculous. This miracle is among God's greatest mercies to remove knowledge from those who will be damaged by it in the future. God's judgments are just and merciful. They will not require that everyone be judged for the knowledge of the smartest or the wisest. He judges each individual by his or her knowledge and wisdom. The more knowledge and wisdom one has, the firmer the judgment. God loves his children enough to permit them to not have the knowledge that would condemn them more than they desire. We'll see that later with Cain. We also see it with Satan, that his once vast knowledge has been reduced so that he cannot have the level of influence he could have had if he knew everything. That Lucifer, a son of the morning, could lose so much light as to be so completely defeated, to know that he was so completely defeated yet could do nothing about it, must sting something fierce. There are many minor reasons that people assume that members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints are simply grasping at straws. Ignorant critics attack minor aspects of church doctrine that they lack the knowledge or experience necessary to grasp. That list includes, but is certainly not limited to, the following. The location of the Garden of Eden, the age of Adam, and a certain out-of-context statement by Brigham Young proclaiming Adam as God. I will show you that each of these is a misunderstanding that can be easily remedied, but the power of the Holy Ghost that has taught millions of members of a restored church that Adam and Eve are among the noblest and greatest cannot be denied. As with all attacks on the church, critics hyperemphasize trivialities they lack the clarity to do anything about, but fail to make any headway on disproving the whisperings of the Spirit that testifies of all things true. 
as pertaining to the location of the Garden of Eden, the book of Genesis is clear as to its geography, namely, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pishon, that is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah. And the name of the second river is Gihon, the same is it which compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hidekel, that is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. It is these verses that cause many to ridicule the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, for many of that faith proclaim with adamancy that the Garden of Eden is located in Jackson County in modern-day Missouri. This is due to a misunderstanding of the prophetic words of Joseph Smith, Jr., who stated the following, Spring Hill, in Jackson, Missouri, is named by the Lord Adam on Diamond, because, said he, it is the place where Adam shall come to visit his people, where the Ancient of Days shall sit, as spoken of by Daniel the prophet. This is given in conjunction with another revelation. Three years previous to the death of Adam, he called Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, and Methuselah, who were all high priests, with the residue of his posterity who were righteous, into the valley of Adam on Diamond, and there bestowed upon them his last blessing. And the Lord appeared unto them, and they rose up and blessed Adam, and called him Michael, the prince, the archangel. This is extrapolated by many to mean that Spring Hill in Missouri is, in fact, the location of the Garden of Eden. Note for all of you who have grown up with that understanding the clear lack of mention of the Garden of Eden anywhere in those verses. I challenge you to peruse all of the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith and find anywhere a single reference to the Garden of Eden being anywhere other than eastward. You will not, because it was never stated thus, because it probably was not so. Ultimately, it does not matter to our salvation to know the exact location of the Garden of Eden. Of the four locations given in Genesis to describe its location, most have been lost to time, memory, and seismic activity. What we do know is that Ethiopia has been, for millennia, a nation in Africa of varying sizes. Both the historically significant nation of Assyria and the Euphrates, which has been a river of great import to the world's history, are located in the Middle East. The historian Josephus, whose many writings I will amply use in future lessons, says that Gihon is the Nile and Pishon is the Ganges River in India. To assume that the Garden of Eden was somewhere in Western Asia makes sense, seeing that it would be considered eastward by global standards, and it may have been hundreds or thousands of square miles. It is my personal belief, but never say that it is doctrine, and I will recant this just as soon as I say it, if told otherwise that the Garden of Eden sat upon the same ground that became the city of Jerusalem. Specifically, the Mount of Olives, where the most sacred of all ordinances, the Atonement of Jesus Christ, took place, the Garden of Gethsemane. It is well within the scope of what we have seen from God to use the same holy place for both of his most significant events of human history, the fall of Adam and the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. This is certainly not doctrine, and I have struggled with the Spirit whether or not I should share it. If I ever hear it stated from the pulpit, until such a time as the location of Eden has been revealed officially, I will feel eternally guilty, but I want to put the idea out there that God does everything with rhyme, reason, and rhetoric, not at random. After his inevitable fall, Adam was required to leave the garden to till the earth. Why then is there confusion as to Adam living in modern America? Heavenly Father never told us that Adam stayed near the Garden of Eden throughout his sojourn in the world. That was something people made up on their own. We may have superimposed the difficulty of moving from one place to another that we have in our day onto Adam's day. Boundaries of language, culture, and means were not present. Also, the continents had not yet divided according to the account given by Moses. To that end, I would postulate that Adam and Eve and their ever-growing tribe could have wandered for many years before finding a place to settle. To prevent them from ever returning, God placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the Tree of Life. What exactly that entails, we do not truly know, but we know that cherubim were not the chubby little babies with fairy wings and diapers that we see on Valentine's Day. They are depicted in Hebrew mythology as tall, powerful angels, their power manifested in their symbolic hawk-like wings. They were sentinels of God's own personal order, angels of high rank and authority, more than capable of protecting the tree of life. Now, keeping in mind that return would mean instant death and the disapproval of God, 
would righteous and conscientious Adam and Eve have stayed in close proximity to the garden? Imagine you had lived your entire life in a utopian paradise with no need to work by the sweat of your brow, only to be cast out forever on penalty of death. That was the reality for Adam and Eve. To assume that they would stay close to such a potent temptation would be like assuming that a repentant and recovering alcoholic, trying to be a benefit to society, would intentionally move next door to a liquor store. Is it possible? Yes, at least in our modern world. Is it practical? No. Especially since Adam and Eve had a whole new world to explore. That is probably what they spent years doing, exploring, charting, mapping the world. Adam, as I mentioned before, was the pinnacle of human intellect. He had much to learn, explore, and do. He would have likely traveled much, tested the quality of the soil in places where he had sojourned, planted appropriate foliage, taken account of local fauna, named the landforms, mapped them out, maybe invented a tool or three along the way to help him do his work. This is not dissimilar to the role he had in the Garden of Eden, to name and identify all animals. As the patriarch of mankind, Adam may have seen it as his duty to travel to every corner of the land his offspring were to inhabit, which was, for the most part, a single contiguous mass. During this time, the Lord's command to multiply and replenish the earth would not have been forgotten. Adam and Eve had to figure out all the vicissitudes of child-bearing and child-rearing. They did not have books by experts or the unsought but constant advice from passers-by to fall back on. There were no hospitals, no midwives, no obstetricians, no epidurals. Anything Adam and Eve discovered would have been entire news to the entire world. It is likely that Adam and Eve had many children during their journeys, and it is entirely possible that some of these children chose to stay behind in one place or another. Tradition unfounded in scripture stated that Adam had 33 sons and 27 daughters, a total of 60 children, which is already an enormous posterity. For all we know, there may have been many more than that. It is unlikely that all 60, or however many there were, stayed in one place when there was so much space for them to spread out. That Adam and Eve eventually established residence is not entirely clear, but they did establish a place of worship at Adam on Diamond. This place, which is in the modern state of Missouri, was of great import to Adam and all of his posterity, including us. The idea that Adam on Diamond was as far as Adam could get from Eden makes sense. After all the effort it took Adam to get away from the garden, the temptation to return would have been kept at a minimum. Satan would never have stopped pushing Adam to return, to destroy him against those cherubim and flaming sword of which we mentioned earlier. But the farther away he got, the more inane those diabolical rumblings would be. It is clear from modern cartography and satellites that the Garden of Eden is no longer on the planet Earth. God will do as he will, and it is possible that he removed Eden from this Earth as soon as Adam was far enough away from it never to return. Even as cherubim and a flaming sword kept Adam away from the garden while he was yet in its shadow, God could do what he would with it when Adam was no longer in its vicinity. It would not have needed to be a momentous event. Even the rotten decay that Adam and Eve introduced to the world may have been sufficient to turn Eden into a wasteland within a generation. Regardless of how he removed it, it is clear that he did so, so none of Adam's ample posterity could feel tempted to partake of the fruit of tree of life and live forever in their sins. Why, then, if the tree of life is such a dangerous entity, would God have created it? The answer comes down to choice. Adam and Eve had to have two choices, the sweet but forbidden fruit of knowledge or the bitter but sustaining fruit of immortality. Without having that choice, they could not have chosen to become and remain mortal. We do not know that they never took of the fruit of the tree of life while in the garden. They were told they could eat any fruit other than the forbidden fruit. What we do know is that there had to be a choice and that that choice of having the tree of life meant that after they had fallen, they could have partaken of it and lived forever in their sins. Once they had made the other choice, however, God would not force them to live forever in their sins. So he provided a means by which only the most foolish could have even tried to become immortal again. There is a possibility that a stymied Satan might have tried one last hurrah to tempt Adam and Eve to partake of the tree of life and then languish forever even as he does. God stopped that plan cold, cutting off Satan's last hopes of destroying Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Satan would not stop trying, but his best chance was taken from him. In that sense, Adam and Eve's banishment, which was to their benefit, was also to Satan's eternal detriment. The idea of the Tree of Life is one of the most prevalent symbols in all religions, further showing a connected origin of all understanding. The Greeks believed in a garden tended by the Hesperides, daughters of the Titan Atlas, which produced a golden fruit given to Zeus and Hera as a wedding gift. The Norse had Yggdrasil, a massive tree that supported and sustained all worlds and dimensions, including our own. 
The Mayans, the Aztecs, the Toltecs, and many other Mesoamerican cultures had a world tree that separated heaven from earth. That each culture would choose a tree as a core symbol of their belief shows the tree as a symbol that unites the world both mythologically and literally. Each of them seem to have a part of the truth while ultimately missing out on the true intent behind it to provide a first choice for our first parents. When taken in the light that the fall of Adam was one of the greatest, most pivotal ordinances of mankind's history, it is no wonder that Eve would be inspired to say, were it not for our transgression, we never should have had seed, and never should have known good from evil, and the joy of our redemption and the eternal life which God giveth unto all the obedient. The life of Adam proceeded from there. We know very little of what he did in his many years on the earth. We know that he labored, as had been commanded, and that Eve, his wife, labored beside him. They had sons and daughters and worshipped the Lord. They built an altar and offered sacrifices. When an angel appeared and asked Adam why he sacrificed, he answered that he did not know, simply that the Lord had commanded it, at which time he was told of the promise of the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sins of the world. Adam was baptized, and likely baptized his own posterity. They watched the stars and mapped the heavens, according to Josephus. They wrote records in a pure and uncorrupted language. There is some discrepancy in the length of time that Adam lived. In the book of Genesis, as well as the Lord's own words to Moses that Joseph Smith was privileged to learn firsthand, it is stated that Adam lived 930 years. However, Joseph Smith reportedly stated that he lived almost a thousand years, short only a few months. There were many different ways these stories can jive together rather than be in opposition, but I will only suggest one. The writings of Josephus and other ancient historians imply that wise leaders, especially righteous ones, would not reign over their dominion until death, but would, upon discovering they had become old, pass the torch to the next generation with months or years to spare. We can think of this in modern terms as them giving their two-week notice for retirement and staying on to train their replacement. Josephus refers to the 930 years of Adam as his governance, meaning the time that he was presiding as the priesthood holder. If there was 69 years after, that would mean that Seth, the son of Adam, would have been the presiding authority and Adam would remain as his advisor. We learn from the Doctrine and Covenants that Seth bestowed the priesthood upon Methuselah, but we also learn in the verse I read before that Methuselah met Adam, so clearly Seth was operating as the priesthood leader under Adam's supervision. Adam was a righteous man, and we see evidence in the Bible and in the Book of Mormon that righteous kings often enjoyed their retirement rather than letting age and possible senescence ruin their rule. Of the patriarchs, whose days are all listed in Genesis, Josephus said, These years collected together make up the sum before set down. But let no one inquire into the deaths of these men, for they extended their lives along together with their children and grandchildren. But let him have regard for their births only. Of all the possibilities, this is the one I think bears most credence, and is the most valuable to the understanding. But I do not dare to push the explanation of this further than I already have, because it seems almost too sacred to elaborate upon further. In the end, it does not matter why this discrepancy exists, if truthfully there was a discrepancy at all. Another discrepancy that gets just as much flack, but is equally meaningless for the sake of argument, is the statement made by Brigham Young that Adam is our father and our God, and the only God with whom we have to do. Some view that as a statement that Brigham Young believed Adam to be the same as the God of Israel, and denounced his status as a prophet of God because of this. It is important to recall that Brigham Young had, along with Joseph Smith and others, studied the Bible to great extent. The word Adam is used in the Hebrew Bible as a name for God, because Adam means man in Adam's own language. The man Adam was the quintessential man, thus being named Adam. In this way, the Hebrews, whose language was very different from Adam's own, acknowledged God as having the form or appearance of a man, not of an ox or a crocodile or a falcon or a dung beetle, like their one-time Egyptian masters believed. This is a manifestation and shortening of God's title, Man of Holiness, a title shortened by transcribers of the Torah as Adam, to avoid the possibility of taking the Lord's name in vain, despite that word not having the same meaning to them as it did to Adam himself. It is also notable that Adam, even as all who remained faithful to their covenants, was promised eventual godhood through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thus Adam will, some day, be ordained to the office of God in the priesthood, with a lowercase g for our world, but an uppercase g for whatever worlds he created, with power and responsibility thereof, only over his sector of the universe, not over the sector of the universe ruled by our beloved Father. 
Another minor discrepancy that acts as an effective segue is that many believe Cain to have been Adam and Eve's firstborn. That Adam and Eve had many sons and daughters, and their sons and daughters had many sons and daughters before the birth of Cain, is implied by the scriptures. It is likely that, until that point, Adam had, by inspiration, ordained many of his sons to the priesthood, specifically to the office of high priest. That his sons would have needed to make that covenant in order to obtain salvation would have been clear to Adam, himself a priesthood holder and a prophet of God. The time came that Cain was born, and he eventually received the oath and covenant of the priesthood. Sometime later, Adam and Eve had another son, whom they named Abel, who would also become a high priest. These sons, like all of Adam's sons, had been commanded to offer sacrifice in symbolism of the sacrifice of the only begotten of the Father. Abel raised sheep while Cain raised crops. When the time came to offer sacrifices, Abel offered, as commanded, a newborn and unblemished lamb. Cain offered produce. God accepted Abel's sacrifice, but not Cain's. Whatever feelings of hatred toward Abel that Cain already had and had allowed to fester in his heart were magnified in that moment. The question may be then asked, if God knew that Cain raised needed crops instead of helpful sheep, why then would he not have accepted Cain's offering? Later offerings in the book of Exodus require the sacrifice of produce. So why was Cain's offering rejected at this time? At least five reasons can be extrapolated from the book of Genesis in the Old Testament and the book of Moses in the Pearl of Great Price. 1. Satan commanded Cain to offer this sacrifice. This is clear from the book of Moses. His reasons could not have been good, but we know that this was at least the start of Cain's demented reasoning. All the other reasons are subject to this one. 2. The sacrifice that Cain was to perform was not a harvest sacrifice or a sacrifice of gratitude. It was a sin offering. A sin offering requires the shedding of innocent blood. In reality, no animal is pure enough to be used as a sin offering, save only Jesus himself. So the sacrifice is purely symbolic of the atonement of Christ. For that symbol to have personal meaning, blood would need to be spilt at personal expense. No other symbol could have been accepted. 3. Just because Cain did not have sheep of his own did not mean he had no access to them. As he knew where his brother labored, he could have offered some of his life-sustaining fruit to Abel in exchange for a lamb. As Abel had been declared by modern revelation to be among those who had been judged worthy of the celestial kingdom of God, it is unlikely that he would deny his own brother the chance of worship. It is clear that Cain did not put forth the effort to obtain the required sacrifice. 4. Cain did not offer his produce out of a desire to follow God's commandments. He did not have a broken heart or a contrite spirit. It is said in the inspired book of Moses that Cain loved Satan more than God. He offered sacrifice not out of sincerity, but as a way of appeasing God. He may even have had the intent to deceive God into thinking he was offering true worship when, in reality, he was going through the motions. 5. The exact words given for Cain's sacrifice in the inspired book of Moses were, Cain offered of the fruits of the ground. This may be reading too far into this verse, and if I am told so by one with authority, I will happily withdraw my analysis of this verse. But as it was initially written in English, and English is a dynamic language, this may be possibly interpreted as follows. Cain went around his field, found fruit that fell on the ground, and offered some of that. If any of these extrapolations are true, it would show that Cain's sacrifice was not only half-hearted, but perhaps even dismissive of God's requirements. At this point, the ultimately Spartan book of Genesis reads as follows. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. The him referred to here is Satan, and to rule over him would mean Cain would be cast into Satan's own eternal prison, the realm called by the Church of Jesus Christ, Outer Darkness. Continuing, it reads, And Cain talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he, the Lord, said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened up her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from my hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. 
And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. This bare-bones account we have in the Torah does not encourage a view of a just and merciful God. Many I know personally have interpreted the takeaways of this account as follows. Cain's sacrifice was not accepted, so he became jealous. He killed his brother in a moment of passion. God judged him harshly and gave him a skin of blackness that his descendants bear to this day. This view distances God from man as a partial God, who picks and chooses those who fit arbitrary characteristics over those who commit crimes of passion in the spur of the moment. The Apostle John, in one of his general epistles, clarified that Cain was not ignorant of his actions. Said he, Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. The Book of Mormon supports that Cain did not stumble into murder by accident. He was no primitive man who did not understand the consequences of his actions. To quote the Book of Ether, and I mention a name from that book here for reasons that will hopefully be clear later, and Achish did administer unto them the oaths which were given to them of old, who also sought power, and which had been handed down even from Cain, who was a murderer from the beginning. And they were kept up by the power of the devil to administer these oaths unto the people, to keep them in darkness, to help such as sought power to gain power, and to murder, and to plunder, and to lie, and to commit all manner of wickedness and whoredoms. This adds an entirely different lens by which we must view Cain. He was a priesthood holder entitled to all the powers and privileges of that office. Cain was not just angry that God rejected his sacrifice, he was angry that he had not accepted it. That sounds redundant, but there is a key distinction between the two. Cain had hoped that by putting forth the bare minimum of effort, he could do what he wished to do on the earth according to the natural man, keep his best goods for himself, and still manage to claim the same glory as his father and brother. He had not been able to win any cosmic brownie points by putting forth an inferior offering, God knew more of Cain's intentions than Cain supposed, which made Cain a great target for Satan. After all, Satan had underestimated God too, and as they say, misery loves company. We do not know how much time passed between Cain's failed sacrifice and the murder of his brother Abel. We do know that Cain turned his heart from God to the devil, who promised him what is vaguely referred to in Genesis as his, meaning Satan's, desire. Satan then passed to Cain, and, as well we learn in the book of Moses, those who were with him, including Cain's own wife, the rites of the secret combination, his own perverted twist on the sacred ordinances of God. Like the holy ordinances that Satan attempts to counterfeit, there is a sign of a covenant and a promise made in the act of joining a secret combination. But unlike a priesthood ordinance, which promises eventual blessings to those who keep the covenant, Secret combinations require an immediate toll from those who fail to live up to them. Satan, having no body of his own, promised Cain, and we know of no other to whom he has specifically made this promise, the chance to rule over him forever in his eternal punishment. As Cain had been born into this world, he was promised a resurrection through Jesus Christ. But if he turned away from Christ, even as Satan had, he would end up in the same abyss as the only one there to have a body. That would make him the absolute master of Satan and all of his angels, as anyone with a body has infinitely more power than someone without. It is widely stated that the denial of the Holy Ghost is the sole unforgivable sin. This is true, but it is also not well understood just how far one has to push to be guilty of that sin. Like Lucifer in the world before, the only people who can possibly receive no glory at all, but be cast out to exist in eternal darkness, are those who intentionally chose to do so. Rejecting the Savior, knowingly committing sins, and even going against the promptings of the Spirit are actions for which there is spiritual condemnation, but none by itself is as serious as the unforgivable sin. The reason that sin, the sin of denying the Holy Ghost after he has power over you, is unforgivable is because it is the desire of the individual not to be forgiven. Cain knew fully well what he was doing and intentionally chose not to take back what he did. He endured to the end, in a sense, but in a dark way, a way contrary to God's will. Cain, and it is possible no other in the history of this earth, though I spare my judgment, chose to never be forgiven. Just like Lucifer, he spat on the hand of the Savior and told him that he would never repent, even if given the chance. 
There have been murders, even premeditated fratricides like Cain committed, that have led to a guilty conscience and deep repentance. There have been cultists who plot in the dark and try to take power, who later turn away from the darkness they swore to serve. The crime Cain committed was far worse. He promised to forego the right to repentance forever, no matter the personal cost. It could not have been a single event, but a lasting, repeated offense remembered with pride every day of Cain's mortal life. He chose the personal and eternal cost entirely on his own. The devil persuaded him, but in the end, the choice was his. The devil offered Cain his own kingdom. Cain agreed that it was better to be the king of hell than a prince in heaven. His pride brought him to commit the murder of the righteous Abel, not because he was angry and did not know better, but because it was the price Satan demanded for his prize that he was going to award Cain. In contract terminology, Cain agreed to kill Abel if Satan agreed to welcome him straight into his eternal nothingness. The other term, as has always been a part of Satan's deals, was that nobody who swore themselves to this secret combination would ever tell a soul of the dirty double dealing. This is a counterfeit of God's law of obedience, namely, that if we obey God, he can bless us for obeying him. Inversely, if anyone who has made a deal with the devil should disobey, he forfeits more than he was promised, for the devil has no power to bless. It is also a counterfeit of the law that sacred things must remain sacred. The devil blurs the line between sacred and secret, and convinces people that anything too sacred to share must inherently be evil, all the while telling those who engage with him in secret pacts that their promises are sacred. And so it was that Cain contracted with the devil to provide the blood of Abel and not tell a soul, that he might, thereby, speedily come to reign over him in outer darkness. What he did not understand, due to the loss of light, was that he could not hide his atrocity from the eyes of an omniscient God. When God asked him where Abel was, he was caught between a rock and a hard place. He could lie to God and possibly have his promised coronation as king of hell stripped out from underneath him, or he could break his oath to the devil, tell God, and definitely lose out on his promised title, the only thing Satan could truly promise him. His answer, I know not, am I my brother's keeper? may not have been a total lie. He had probably disposed of Abel's body such that he could not be certain where the body was. After all, hiding the evidence is Homicide 101, and, as I said, Cain was no caveman. He was a man of perfect understanding, else he could never have fallen so far. At the same time, he did not break his oath to keep the murder secret. God then curses Cain in three ways. First, the land will not bring again her strength, meaning he can no longer farm or live off of the produce he grew. This seems extreme, but Cain had used the fruit of the earth to mock God, and God would not allow Cain to mock him further. This may sound petty, that God demands we not mock him, but, like all of his commandments, this is for us, not for him. Us mocking him amounts to exactly nothing as far as his power is concerned, but it does significant damage to our receptiveness to the Holy Spirit. Second of God's curses against Cain, no man could slay him. This also means that he could not slay himself. We see, after Judas Iscariot's betrayal of Jesus, that the man hung himself in a field, purchased with the filthy lucre he obtained for his betrayal. This may not have been out of guilt. Elder James E. Talmadge suggested it might have been Judas' way of going to be with his eternal master. He suggested this as a theory, not to judge Judas, but it does add a question to Cain's story. Was Cain prevented from killing himself? so that he would have to experience his guilt for the remainder of his days, never experiencing the absolution the devil promised him? Third, a mark was put upon Cain so nobody would dare to kill him. This was not, again, to protect Cain. He had forsaken God's protection forever. It was to force him to continue in his sins with no hope of relief from guilt. This was the sign to his offspring and to all of us that God's eternal punishments are personal and unique to the individual. Cain may have had plans, either to live the rest of his life like nothing happened, or to rile up enemies to kill him. One way or another, this curse was more than Cain could bear, because it shattered the promise the devil had made with him. Even though he did not violate his own demonic covenant, the promise was still voided. He was promised Abel's flocks, but this was only a small prize. The devil may have literally promised him the world, only for God to tell him that the devil has no claim for the world. That Cain would eventually become the king of hell as he wished is the only mercy Cain permitted himself by signing his contract with the devil in the blood of his righteous brother. 
But being king of hell will not be easy or painless for him. In fact, where all the other evil ones in outer darkness chose to waive their rights to a body and, therefore, experience no pain, only eternal nothingness, he, Cain, will have an eternal body, which will certainly, some day in the future, be racked with horrible sensations of that demonic prison with no hope of freedom. It is the most Heavenly Father can do for Cain to delay his resurrection. After that occurs, Cain's eternity will be one of misery. Referring to the mark that was placed upon Cain, it makes me cringe to hear anyone say that it changed his skin dark like the skin of modern Africans. We do not know what the nature of the curse of Cain was. If his offspring were made to have a darker skin, that did not mean that they reflected the sin of Cain. It may have kept some of Adam's righteous posterity from intermarrying with Cain's immediate family. However, it is far more likely that the mark placed upon Cain was one set into his countenance, something that could not be denied upon meeting him, that did not reflect on his descendants, at least not the ones who choose the path of righteousness. That the descendants of Ham were denied priesthood was less a reflection of their unholy ancestors' monstrous deeds than the acts which I'll discuss in a future seminar, acts of which God was wholly aware, but that he could not justly punish them for until they had been committed. As such, it is not fair to assume, where no doctrine has been given, that just because someone has darker skin implies disfavor with God. More likely the curse of Cain was his and his alone to bear, and that any reflection onto his descendants was because his culture of abominations proliferated for several generations. Certainly there are many who have darker skin by genetics who have a bright shining countenance that cannot be denied, while there are plenty who are fair-skinned but have a foul disposition. Whether or not Cain is among the ancient ancestors of those with dark skin is irrelevant for their salvation. After all, Achish, whom we mentioned earlier, was not likely a descendant of Cain, and yet he still chose to dig up Cain's ancient machinations of evil. Those evils are no more unique to one race or pedigree than are the deeds of righteousness. It is far more likely that skin tone came from the intermarrying of Adam and Eve's descendants, who happened to have darker skin, a darker skin which may have been part of their own genetic makeup, as I discussed before. The writings of Josephus encourage this opinion, that the offspring of Cain is not responsible for his murders or for the actions he performed after he committed the murder of Abel. The historian wrote, And when Cain had traveled over many countries, he with his wife built a city named Nod, where he also had children. However, he did not accept of his punishment in order to amendment, but to increase his wickedness, for he only aimed to procure every thing that was for his own bodily pleasure though it obliged him to be injurious to his neighbors. He augmented his household substance with much wealth by rapine and violence. He excited his acquaintance to procure pleasures and spoils by robbery, and became a great leader of men into wicked courses. He also introduced a change in the way that simplicity, wherein men lived before, and was the author of measures and weights, and whereas they lived innocently and generously, he changed the world into cunning craftiness. There are at least two major takeaways here. One, that he whose name meant I have used the remainder of his days to have more and more of the things of this world in hopes that they would be the one glowing light in the eternity of blackness he chose for himself. And two, his offspring was not necessarily cursed with his love of filthy lucre, but those who chose to engage in such wanton pursuits followed him into darkness of their own free will. It is entirely possible and likely that the gospel was preached to the land of Nod. Cain's offspring would go on to create the harp, the organ, works of fine brass and iron, the development of great tools, and had a vast posterity. When compared to the dark ruts of ignorance that were man's primary companion during the Dark Ages, that sounds like a time of great creativity and learning, things that are typically encouraged by God only during times of righteousness. On the other hand, deep darkness would seep into Cain's lineage, perhaps not as deep as Cain's own, but it is not our place to judge or to know. Cain's fifth great-grandson, Lamech, proudly committed murder and proclaimed of himself, If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech shall be avenged seventy and sevenfold. The historian states, And because he was so skillful in matters of divine revelation, Lamech made known to his wives that he was bold in his profligate behavior, in acting unjustly and doing injuries for gain. Is it possible that the gospel had been restored to the offspring of Cain only for his descendant to have the spiritual and intellectual aptitude required to seek out his ancestors' evil machinations? I cannot say. Either way, from the days of Lamech, the world in Josephus' words became exceeding wicked, everyone successively dying one after another more wicked than the former. They were intolerable in war and vehement in robberies. 
The works of Cain were not reflected in his descendants, but the works of the devil are certainly not unique to Cain or to his family. As for the Mormon myth, and I use the word Mormon to mean that which is connected to the Mormon culture and not to the divine doctrine of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that Cain remains alive and is the being we now know as Sasquatch or Bigfoot, I find no credence to these rumors. The Apostle Paul claimed that only eight survived the flood, Noah, his wife, their three sons, and their wives. If Cain was forced to tarry forever to bemoan his sin, it is not for me to say, but it is clear from the New Testament that an apostle of the Lord did not believe it was so. Cain, being permitted to live past even his father's lengthy life expectancy, may have permitted him many chances to corrupt or pervert other people, but I do not claim to have an answer. I would stake that the most likely turn of events was that, if this event actually occurred, Joseph may have seen the disembodied and wandering spirit of that man Cain, who had chosen to become perdition, the lost. The apocryphal account of Joseph Smith seeing Bigfoot has never been shown to be a true event, and the Sasquatch was not well known outside of a certain western tribe until the late 1870s. Is it possible that Joseph did see Cain, whether in body or in spirit? Sure. Is it likely? Highly doubtful. Is it worth taking salvation on? Not a chance. One thing is clear, however, Cain was no ordinary person. He was a man of keen intellect who had been found worthy to be ordained to the priesthood. Only by making divine contracts with the Almighty, understanding them completely, and then intentionally perverting those covenants by signing on with the devil, could Cain have fallen as low as he did. That Adam felt regret for his son's state is clear from his future actions. Though having many sons, he did not bestow the priesthood on another of whom we are aware until he, Adam, was four hundred years old. That son, Seth, received the priesthood at his father's hand only after his appearance and mannerisms proved to be those of his father. This shows that Adam became much more conservative about the distribution of that ordinance. A look at the chronology presented in Doctrine and Covenants section 107 implies that the priesthood was then passed on by Adam's direct approval and only those who were found worthy were allowed to be ordained to it. He personally bestowed the priesthood upon Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, and Methuselah at his sacred place in Adam on Diamond. Many of them he did not ordain until they were hundreds of years old, after they had proven themselves worthy of the high priesthood. He may have allowed other ordinations, but that he would personally be responsible for ordaining his great-great-great-great-great-grandson shows that he had some vestige of control over who was to be ordained. He would not, he could not, have another cane on his hands. He would not see his own offspring destroyed by the covenants they made, even if it meant temporarily denying priesthood to his less righteous posterity. To some, the priesthood was withheld until such a time as they proved their worth, with Jared receiving the priesthood chronologically after his son Enoch. That Lamech, the righteous son of Enoch and father of Noah, not the descendant of Cain mentioned earlier, was ordained under the hand of Seth and Noah under the hand of Methuselah, shows that the tradition of only the highest patriarch ordaining their descendants to the priesthood continued into this world's third dispensation, a period of at least 1,500 years. Considering how far the children of men could have spread, and that Adam kept such close control over those who would be ordained to the office of the high priesthood, shows that Cain's choices left deep scars on him. But scars do not imply personal wickedness. To conclude, the what informs, the why transforms. The what? Adam and Eve chose to fall, and so did Cain. The why? Adam and Eve were selfless and noble, choosing to forsake painless immortality for the sake of having an eternal family. Cain also chose to fall, choosing to go against his priesthood covenant for the sake of his own craven desires. God was perfectly just in both cases, and perfectly merciful too, permitting both parties to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediator of all men, or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil. I close this account in the name of the Savior, even Jesus Christ. Amen.